Picasso's father was a painter, mm -hmm. and when he saw Picasso's paintings, he said, I'm never going to paint again because he was so good. Huh. Are you worried about that happening today at all? Or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey team, it's Henry and I'm here with Rachel and today we're going to try and do some face painting. Yeah. That's right. So, first thing I thought we could do is make what's called a split cake. So, I don't know if you've ever seen when people do face painting, um, they get these really cool um, like blends of colour. Mm -hmm. um, when I first tried it, I was trying to, you know, take blue and gold and, and mix them together on someone's face. Um, doesn't work that well. What works even better is taking face paints, cutting them up, putting them together and then you've got this nice block that you can um, take the one sponge or brush, run it over and get this beautiful um, blend to then create flowers, dragons, birds. Here is a little pot. Now in front of us here we've got a whole heap of different colours um, and you're welcome to choose. Let's do orange, blue, is that green? Green. I'm going to Cut a bit of the one that I want, and then mold it a bit like clay. So just okay. roll it, uh, roll it into a bit of a sausage, and then just press it into. A, you can decide what order you want it in, but mm -hmm. basically we're going for um, sausages that are just going to sort of be stuck together. Baby wipes are a face painter's best friend. So they get everything. It's amazing. So what started you off in face painting? Um. I used to live near a $2 shop, which is one of my favourite places to lose hours just wandering around. Um, and saw that they had, um, yeah, face paints one day and thought, that looks like fun. I do a lot of kids camps and, you know, yeah, camps with people with disabilities and stuff. And thought this could be a, a fun thing to bring to it, you know, other people bring their guitars along. Why don't I bring some uh, some face paint? I love the delight on people's faces. Mm -hmm. when, they first, you know, they've been sitting there patiently and doing something on their face and then when they first see themselves in the mirror and there's just this joy. So what you're going to do is take your little spritzer. Yep. Yeah. Get your um, thing a bit wet so I don't know how well this will go facing downwards. Okay. okay. Give, it up. Give it a bit of a squirt. Let's get your brush a little bit wet to start with and dry it off from here. Mm -hmm. And then we're just going to go back and forth over your colours and yeah wherever you want to start playing you can play on your own arm or mine if you like. Um, <laughs> Ooh, it's like dirt. <laughs> I like it it makes me think of something tropical flavoured. <laughs> Isn't that a huge scam that the paddle pops, paddle pops they're just so caramel, caramel? Flavor. yeah. <laughs> Huge I have camp. to say, if it was going to turn out to be anything, I'm glad it's caramel. Some of the cool stuff that you can do with these now is um, make different shapes and things. So, like, whatever I've just made here, uh, I'm going to say could be the start of a gecko. Sounds like a sad tadpole. <laughs> yeah. And do you have a daily, daily thing that you have to do to maintain your, your well-being? I, I used to... Um, be a lot more resilient. I used to have it as like a, an actual, you know, practice. Since being a mum, mm -hmm. I am struggling to find the time to put these things into practice and it, it, yeah. I guess it's all the more important. So I used to do yoga, uh, yoga or Pilates for an hour a day mm -hmm. uh, and I loved it. That was my, that was my wake up ritual. Um, I, I really miss that. Mm. Sounds cliche, but that whole you know mind, body, spirit thing. Mm -hmm. What do you think makes people more resilient to to change? I think that we all have buckets that need filling, um, and um, yeah, you know the first would be our, our basic needs: you know, hydration, food, sleep. I think the next one is connection. I think, um, especially for me as an extrovert, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I'm missing connection with people, um, yeah, it, it really saps my energy. How do you know if you're okay? Oh, that's a good question. 
if someone looks at me really genuinely and with concern and mm -hmm. asks if I'm okay, I'll know. Because if I'm not, I will burst into tears. Yeah. <laughs> and that'll be when I realize. Um, but it'll, it'll take that sometimes for me to realize. And I could be operating for days not yeah. being okay. And unless I have taken some time out to check in with myself or unless someone else has gone out of their way to check in with me. So. What kind of questions do you wish people would ask? I mean, are you okay is a great one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, yeah, as long as it's done right and people are, you know, prepared for that conversation if the answer, if when the answer is no. I'd love to hear people ask things like, you know, what are you excited about? And stuff yeah, like that that's a, good one. a lot more. Something else that can be fun to play with with uh, split cakes is mm -hmm. um, the flowers or leaves. What's the, um, the way you like people to support you when you're having a difficult time. What's the word? Active listening. Yeah. That can make a huge difference for me. Uh, not trying to fix my problems, but um, rather just being there and helping me sort out what I'm thinking and feeling. Do you think people understand how, how difficult it is for new parents? No, for sure. And I think also acknowledging that everyone's parenting journey is so different and uh, each family is different, each child is different. Yeah, I mean something that I definitely never understood was postnatal depression. I used to hear stories on the news where they'd say, go for it, where they'd say something about um, a, a mother taking her life. And I feel like, along with all of the people around me, I would be thinking, you know, how could you not think of your children? How, you know, how, how, how could you be so selfish? Was I, I feel like the comment that would you know, resound around mm -hmm. the house where I was. Um, and um, and I, yeah, I was kind of there with that comment and I'd sort of you know, be offhandedly saying, oh, you know, we, you never know what's going on for people, but I, I, I yeah, just couldn't, couldn't get it at all. Mm -hmm. And then, when I was in that situation, so um, for context, mm -hmm. um, between our two kids, um, Lenny and Calliope, we um, suffered a miscarriage, um, and it was incredibly traumatic. Um, and that was actually what what sent me into that perinatal depression and mm -hmm. um, I, I was severely suicidal for a while there um, and the, the thing that I had never considered was that it was like someone was yelling at me in my head hey, if you really loved them you'd do the right thing mm. and this uh, deluded logic was telling me that the right thing, as far as my family was concerned, was to eliminate me from the picture, was mm -hmm. to take my own life. Um, and so it was completely the opposite to what I'd previously thought with that misconception of, you know, how could you be so selfish? How could you escape and leave your family? Mm -hmm. It wasn't that at all. Uh, I still loved life. I still wanted to be there. I just really, really felt like every second that I was alive was somehow doing irreparable damage mm. to these people that I love so much and yeah so it, it felt like this imperative this this compulsion to to need to take my life for their sake mm -hmm. um, and um, and having felt that and knowing what I know now I think the Judgment or blame is the last thing that anyone suffering mental health problems, but you know, particularly, um, particularly a parent, the last thing they need is is that that judgment. But for me, mm -hmm. there was a, a really serious rehabilitation period. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I couldn't take care of myself, let alone anyone else. Pretty severe post-traumatic stress, um, such that um, in a room I'd often need to back up to a wall sort of thing because the feeling of anyone behind me felt so legitimately threatening that I was mm. completely in that fight or flight state. Um, for me, I had to address it on a chemical level as well, mm -hmm. um, which I guess that I guess that's one thing I'd want people to know is that I provided the buffer to allow me to do the work that I needed to mm -hmm. emotionally to start getting back to myself. My real fear had been that um, it would keep me from feeling like myself, like I would somehow come out feeling like someone else. Um, okay. It totally didn't. It, it enabled me to start feeling like me again. Questions are often the best mm -hmm. advice and, and um, one of the best ones that I yeah, have been asked and, and I guess therefore like to ask is, is it helpful? Mm. Because when your own mind is fighting you, it can be so easy to get caught up in, um, is this true, is it not, is this who I am? Mm. But if you bring it back to, you know, is focusing on this helpful, mm. uh, is what I'm hearing helpful, then it's much easier to say yes or no. It sounds a lot like um, mindfulness, like noting. Yeah. Like I'm noting, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. And be, being able to separate the depression out as kind of its own persona and character. I could talk with my husband, Stu, and say, um, the depression is telling me this, or, you know, mm -hmm. the voices are, you know, it, it wasn't hearing voices like a, an audio yeah, yeah. thing, but, you know, yeah, I, I could, and that way we together could fight it and hold it as a separate entity to me. So rather than me saying something like, um, I'm thinking of killing myself or, um, you know, the way you looked at me when I said this made me feel worthless. Mm. I, I think I'm worthless. Instead, I could reframe it and say, okay, right now the depression is telling me I'm worthless. Mm -hmm. And just that extra degree of separation helped me acknowledge it as something to fight and not a part of myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks amazing. Thank you. I tried to do the rock, but it didn't quite work. And then I did my watch on the other side. And then I, I did that it. green guy. It was gonna be a frog, but then I couldn't quite work out or remember if frogs had hair or legs. <laughs> and then I just did a shopping list. Oh, nice. <laughs>So after the interview with Rach, I practiced body painting a lot and I was determined to try and recreate a picture of her, but all my drawings kind of looked like I was blindfolded and trying to paint one of the Muppets. So in the end, I had to resort to paper. My healing was um, and is a process. I read something the other day, are you improving or are you relapsing? Um, and I would look at that statement, I would say, yes. Mm. Yes, I am healing, yes, I am moving forward. And sometimes relapsing is part of that. It's it's not yeah. a dichotomy if or, it's some, yeah, sometimes that's the way of the journey and, and, and knowing that um, steps backwards are part of going forwards. Give it a quick wipe and then it's good as new. Wow. Um, uh, is that the same as kids after just a quick wipe and good as new? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try and cover up my tattoos, make my parents proud again. <laughs> <laughs>